All right, this is the one. Let's do this. What is up, guys? Welcome to episode 20 of the Player vs. Live podcast. As always, my name is Gabo, and I will be your host. I am so hyped to introduce this next guest. He is a nuclear astrophysicist and professor of physics and astronomy at the University of North Carolina. His research focuses on understanding the nature behind star explosions, the evolution of stars, and the origin of the elements in the cosmos. He is here to give us a deep understanding of the universe we live in, but also we had a lot of fun discussing the influence of science fiction and analyzing the physics behind Star Wars weaponry. If you enjoy this content, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Please give a warm welcome to Christian Iliadis. I have a nuclear astrophysicist in front of me or, you know, virtually in front of me. And I want to I want to find out how does astrophysics can influence like a general population, right? I know you have an interest also in educating the general population, if you could say. Yeah, I do have an interest. I do think that in academia, most of us, we're not doing a good enough job to educate the public. That's a problem for research grants that we apply for and because the people who make the decisions, if they're not informed, it's it's difficult for them to, to grant the funds. But also I think science has specialized so much over the last decades that it's really frequently difficult for the scientists who do their work to explain it to the public. It's just so, we have all developed our own language and um, our own concepts and they're super specialized mm. and that's the wrong direction. We need to get back and put things down in simple language that people can understand it. Yeah. One of the problems I see in particular with your field is that you're dealing with concepts like quantum mechanics that are incredibly hard to understand. It must be another job in, in itself because doing your research is one thing and then actually curating this this entire experience for the public is it's a unique task right yeah yeah this is correct and if you look what's out there in the press it's pretty much always the same things it's black holes and it's the big bang and it's neutrinos because it's a new cycle The more you report on these few things, the more people will have it on their minds, the more questions they ask about them. But there are so many other things around that are perhaps more complicated to explain and we're not doing a good enough job. And that's why you're reading always about the same few things. Science is incredibly rich and there are many, many mind boggling concepts out there but you rarely see them explained. So one of the reasons why I wanted to have you here is because you told me about one of this amazing class of yours called uh, physics in movies, where you uh, kind of dissect and analyze some of the physics that are portrayed in movies. No, it's a little more complicated than that. (laughs) There are a number of books out there that debunk science that's not portrayed correctly in in Mm -hmm. movies. For me, these books, they miss an opportunity. In class, what we do is really, I would show clips of movies, action movies, science fiction movies. And in some of these clips, the physics portrayed is very realistic. And in others, it's not realistic. And the students learn how to disentangle that. The point of the class is for students to understand, oh, this is realistic, this is not realistic. So when I show them a clip, they don't know Um, if it's realistic or not. So they need to figure it out. And that's a way how you educate them. Right. Once, once the class is over, they have a really good feeling for what is possible and what is not possible. This is really the main goal of that class. (laughs) That's awesome. That's amazing. I think it's a, it's an amazing uh, way to, to educate. So, but I want to get familiar a little bit and I want to the audience to get familiar with nuclear astrophysicists as a whole, as a profession, as a field, what are the questions that you guys are concerned with? So nuclear astrophysics, if you look at a star, 
then you see the light from the star that reaches your eye. This light, this energy was produced somewhere and was produced by nuclear reactions, fusion reactions inside the stars. The same thing happens in our sun. So in nuclear reactions, every time a reaction occurs, it generates energy, but it also changes the composition. Two elements fuse and out comes something different. And while fusing, it generates the energy that stabilizes stars. So we're really concerned with two main aspects. One is the energy generation. It makes stars stable and that drives some stellar explosions. And the other one is the origin of the elements. How exactly through which fusion reactions have these elements been produced? And this is very far reaching consequences because stars evolve and then they somehow die. And during their evolution, they will shed these new elements that were fused by nuclear reactions into the interstellar medium. And out of that material, new stars are being born. This is exactly what happened to our solar system. The sun and the planets consist of matter that underwent this cosmic cycling many, many times. Mm. So this is our connection, the connection between life and, and what's happening in the stars. It's interesting because you're explaining this entire process. Is that what we actually see when we look up the stars? This process of, of shedding new elements and creating new ones, is it visible to us? Yes, this is visible to us. So there is direct proof for this. And one proof is we do not only see visible light, so the blinking of the starlight, but we observe all types of radiation from the cosmos. Mm. So we see infrared radiation, we see ultraviolet radiation, but we also see much more energetic radiation. We see gamma rays and we see gamma rays of a very specific energy that we know derives from the radioactive decay of a certain isotope of aluminum. And this tells us, because the half-life of this radioactive element is relatively short, we know that this shedding of elements and this enrichment of the interstellar medium with newly fused elements is happening right now. So that's one of the proofs, mm. but there are other proofs too. Sometimes when people hear theory, it's a theory. They would say, yeah, yeah, it's a nice theory, but <laughs> uh, we don't know if it's happening. When we talk in science, in physics, about fundamental theories, then this is the best explanation we have. And all evidence we have points to exactly that this is happening. So this theory of nuclear astrophysics this is not just some fancy idea, but this is really happening. So we have observational proof for that. I mean, it's a mesmerizing experience to look at the stars. I think, I think I can say this for everybody is that they somehow, you know, lose themselves when looking up into a starry night sky and realize how big the universe is. Right. And then you kind of look at your feet and for a second you realize how small you are compared to this, to this huge, vast universe. So I feel that looking at the stars makes you place yourself in the cosmos, understanding that this is an expansive world that we don't know about. Do you, do you get inspiration from looking at the stars? Did some of it influence you to become an astro astrophysicist? Oh yeah. I think this is true for all of us. And, and each of us, we see, or we feel something slightly different when we look at the stars. You mentioned that you get a feeling for how big things are, but really, if you just look at the night sky without telescopes, I don't think you really can get a feeling for how big the universe really is because to the ancients, they thought there is this sphere far away, but it has little holes. And that's, those are the stars, meaning the spheres at a fixed distance or already just by looking at the stars, you know, that there's something out there that's vast, but you cannot imagine how vast it is. We have mm. no intuitive feeling for that. Yes. So right. for me, by, of course, it's a spiritual experience. If you are at a very dark 
sky location and you can see the Milky Way. And what is interesting to me is that the stars at fixed positions, so apart from the planets, the stars, the entire sky rotates because of the rotation of Earth. So there's something very regular there. It happens every night. And this regularity that you have no impact on, you cannot reach out and touch the stars mm -hmm. and you cannot make a star move differently. This regularity is in complete contrast to the very chaotic life on Earth mm -hmm. that is so different, that's changing all the time, our interactions with our friends and peers yeah. and what humans do. Yeah, to me, it's almost like a manifest that there's like two different time scales or there are many different time scales. We have the time scale of the cosmos where, you know, if we look at how much time we've actually been part of the history of the cosmos and we put it into like a two week period, I think, I think it's like something around humanity only lasts like two seconds of the last day. So there's something to be said about our sun is dying, right? Technically, like it's a star that is dying, but because we don't belong in that time scale, we don't really, we perceive it differently. Yeah, no, you're right. And the sun, it will evolve like every star, but it's in middle age. <laughs> so it's about four and a half billion years old, but it will go another five billion years. Right. Um, we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't have to worry about it. This is another thing that we have intuitive problems with exactly what you just said uh human life those few million years on a cosmic scale that's really nothing that's a blink of the eye so not only do we have these vast distances for which we have no intuitive <laughs> feeling for but also we have these these huge time duration that's kind of what einstein's theory of relativity starts to compare and answer right yes correct yeah this is our best our best theory, the theory of general relativity, our best theory for, for vast scales in the universe. It's one of the pillars of our fundamental understanding of nature. People are always interested in well, what, is, what is space and what is time. Philosophers centuries ago, they thought about is, can there be space without time? Can there be time without space? Which one is more important? So the theory of general relativity uh, which Einstein published in, in 1916, tells us that there is no separate space and there's no separate time. There's, there's space time. And space time is very different, behaves very different from our everyday experience. We don't need to worry too much about space time and everyday life, but when you go to larger scales, it becomes important. So the theory says that whenever you have a lot of mass somewhere in the universe, then this, this mass will warp the space time. And once you realize that, then a, a lot of different phenomena are possible that are absolutely mind boggling. For example, black holes or wormholes and many other things. And this was the big revolution in our understanding of how the space time really is very different mm. to what we perceive in everyday life when we think about space and time separately. I have a hard time trying to like put a word onto what would you describe is, is space time? So is it an entity? Is it a, a force? Is it a fabric? What would you, <laughs> what would you say it is? So nobody can really imagine it in, in a simple picture or an image like as a because human. it's a, it's a four dimensional construct mm. and we only can think in, in spatial and three spatial dimensions. And when you see, you do see sometimes when it's explained to students that space time is like the surface of a sphere or depending on the curvature, it's uh, like a saddle shape, but these are just very crude images. These are analogies. This is not the real thing. <laughs> When you say it's fabric, it's a fabric of some kind. When we say space-time expands and people sometimes think that there's something moving within and it's, it's no, it's not moving within. It's really space-time itself that, that changes. You cannot imagine it in the simple. It's very similar to quantum mechanics, which you mentioned earlier. We 
have analogies, but all the physics in quantum mechanics is embedded in the wave function. We cannot imagine simply a wave function and mm -hmm. textbooks will have these little waves, but the wave function is complex. It's a complex entity. It's not a real thing, but it has all the physics embedded in it. And once you understand this wave function, you can manipulate it mathematically and gives you all the effects that happen in reality. You mean a wave function, meaning like a sine wave? A sine wave, but that's just a crude sketch. So a wave function is not simply a sine wave mm -hmm. and it's not a real wave. Mm -hmm. So when you go back to the history of quantum mechanics early on, people thought maybe it's a real wave, a meta wave, but it's not. It just, it's a mathematical construct that tells you if you square mm. this expression for the wave function, that tells you something about the likelihood of finding an object at a given point in space. Mm. So when we talk about radio waves, then these are physical waves and we know what the wavelengths are and yeah, we cannot see them, but we know they're, they're a real entity. We can think about them, but not so a wave function. And this is the reason why it took people such a long time to wrap their heads around this. Mm. And really nobody fundamentally at a certain level understands quantum mechanics, but it's the most successful theory that we have in all of science. What makes you say that? Oh, because it has many practical applications and quantum mechanics, of course, explains all natural phenomena. Mm. I should say there's no phenomenon that contradicts quantum mechanics. And if you think about all these objects, for example, when you're using your, your smartphone, your smartphone stores data in flash memory. Flash memory only works because of quantum mechanical tunneling, mm. which is one of the most incredible effects in all of science. It really says that if you kick a soccer ball against the wall, there's a finer chance this ball will make it through the wall without breaking the wall. It will not go over the wall. It will go through the wall without breaking it. And if you do this experiment with a soccer ball, it has a far too small probability to happen even over the lifetime of the universe. But the probability is not zero. Now, if you go to very small entities, to electrons or protons, this does happen. And it's very important. We talked about nuclear astrophysics, fusion reactions in stars. They only occur because of quantum tunneling. And back to the information is stored in flash memory. So electrons need to be put or subtracted from certain small regions in flash memory to store the information. That's only happening because of quantum tunneling. So sometimes people say to me, oh, you know, this is a nice theory. We don't believe it. And I say, if you don't believe quantum mechanics, you should not be using your smartphone <laughs> because if you don't, you know, <laughs> you don't believe in it. Exactly. Uh, you're talking about the influence of astrophysics in the technologies that we actually use today as somebody like me, like a regular human being who doesn't understand these concepts very well, right? Do you constantly see this kind of influence of your field permeating through these technologies? So the influence, of course, is there. It's huge. It's very important. But for the very big discoveries that, that change our lives, there's always a very long time delay in between. So maybe people have discovered now something a few years ago, but will not hear about this having any practical impact until several decades down the road. So if you think about quantum tunneling, this was discovered theoretically in the 1920s mm. and flash memory was maybe invented maybe around the, the 1970s. Or if you think about the theory of general relativity published in 1916 and GPS, the global positioning system, it's absolutely crucial for that to work, that we correct for these effects from general relativity. So there's again a time delay of many decades. And this is a problem, of course, if you think about funding or how it's perceived by the general public and by politicians, Politicians don't think in terms of, of several decades mm. between discovery and impact. They think in terms of a four year period of time. So they want instant gratification in that sense. <laughs> and sometimes we need to be more patient. 
of course, even in my research, I'm in fundamental physics, but some of the things that we are working on, they're very, they're also important for practical applications. There's one book I should recommend you that I've been reading and I've been fascinated with. It's called Life 3.0. This AI research scientist who wrote this entire book about how we should look at AI in the future and what things we should be concerned about. What are the concepts that you should be familiar so that you can have a, an informed conversation about it? But it talks about like the cosmic endowment, how much energy there really is in the cosmos, right? And one of the things that struck me is that he said that we're really, really bad at actually turning matter into energy and using the energy that we can find from matter, right? Because if you think about the equation, energy equals matter times the speed of light squared, that means that small amounts of matter, like a cup of coffee or something like that, actually holds huge amounts of energy. Can you like humor me a little bit? Like, why do you think we are so bad? <laughs> or like, what do you think it's missing from us to actually be able to use the cosmic endowment properly? I think that we have very small ambitions when it comes to like trying to solve the energy crisis, for example. We're talking about harvesting the energy of the sun that falls on a small area of Arizona, but we can harvest a lot more energy. The sun has a lot more energy to harvest. Like, why are we so not ambitious? So the problem is not of fundamental physics at all, because all these processes are completely understood. There's nothing mysterious or magic about these. The problem is one of, of technological application and engineering. Mm -hmm. So what you just said, the harvesting of energy depends on the process you take advantage of. So one of a very inefficient process is a chemical reaction. So all energy is really produced by converting a small amount of mass into energy, as you said, the important equation is energy is equal mass times the speed of light squared. In a chemical reaction, there's very, very little mass converted, very little. You couldn't even measure the change in mass. If you think about a chemical bomb, it releases a lot of energy. If you burn gasoline in your car, you get a lot of mileage out of that, but the change in mass is tiny. So let's step this up. The next step up would be nuclear power generation. Mm -hmm. So now you're, you're looking at fission and in fission, there is a little more mass converted to energy and that releases per mass of fuel, much more energy. And that's why, for example, nuclear power plants have completely revolutionized warfare. Well, if you think about aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, nuclear icebreakers, they're so much more efficient. I mean, they mm. can go a year without refueling anything. So we can step this up further. We can go to fusion reactions. This is what powers the stars, our sun, and there a little more mass is converted to energy. It's much more efficient. But still, as you say, it can be even much more efficient. The only process we know of that completely converts mass into energy is matter antimatter annihilation. This is the, by far the most efficient process. And this is not just a fancy theory. This happens all the time, right? Where you sit right now in the walls, because a lot of the radioactive elements in everyday materials, the floors, the walls, the ceiling, some of them emit positrons. Positrons, while they decay radioactively, positrons are the antiparticles of electrons. Mm -hmm. Now, these positrons, after the decay, when they are created in a wall, for example, they move by a few millimeters until they meet with another electron. And this is the perfect example for matter antimatter annihilation because these, this one positron and the one electron will annihilate completely. The mass is now completely converted into energy, into gamma rays. And if you harness that process, that is the most efficient process. And it's also the limiting process. Mm. You cannot do any better. Mass completely disappears. Now you can imagine if you don't do this with electrons and positrons, which have a tiny, tiny mass, right. if you can do this with 
protons and antiprotons, you will generate much more energy. But where do you get the antiprotons from? Well, they're produced at huge accelerator facilities at CERN and Fermilab. So you need a lot of energy to produce them. Mm. Much more energy than you would get out in the end. I see. When it comes to these ideas, these concepts, right? Antimatter, dark matter. Science fiction uses these uh, concepts and kind of takes it to the next level, right? Pushes it into the world of the story. And in the story world, we explore the limits of human emotions, but also the limits of what we can see as our technology advancements and the world that we want to see. When it comes to traveling at the speed of light, uh, you can see that all throughout science fiction. This opens up the gate. It opens up the um, can of worms for everything. Because once you start traveling at the speed of light, the universe is so big that the chance for you to encounter another life form increases exponentially. So I want to kind of dissect a little bit of the science behind that. Is it theoretically possible to travel at the speed of light? No, not exactly at the speed of light. No, no material object can move at the speed of light or faster than the speed of light. But this question is, is really only academic because theoretically, the theory of special relativity will tell you that you can travel with 99.99999 and so on percent of the speed of light. Mm -hmm. That is possible. So you're pretty much almost traveling with the speed of light. Like, so let's say, let's say I want to go from the center of the earth to the edge of the observable universe, right? So, yeah, you have to be careful. The observable universe, that's an interesting concept. So first of all, the universe is 14 billion years old. Mm -hmm. And the distance light travels in one year is called a light year. So then you may think that if light was emitted 14 billion years ago, then it traveled 14 billion light years. And that's at the edge of the observable universe. This mm -hmm. is as far as we can see. But now you need to add another piece of information to this, other than this light travel time that's finite. The other piece of information is that the universe is expanding. So picture now this, this object that's 14 billion years ago emitted light and this now reaches your eyes. Well, the time it took for the light to travel, because space is expanding, this object is now much, much further away. So although the light travel time is only 14 billion years, the proper time, this is the present day distance of that object is much, 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 much further. So if you take these into account, you can calculate that um, the observable universe is we can look out to 47 billion years, light years. <laughs> so it's so crazy to think about these things. I mean, 14 billion light years is, is already like an Im immeasurable number in my mind, right? Yeah, and, and... yeah. And this is, again, it's important <laughs> to note here that this is not just some fancy theory. So we have observed recently, my research group has observed the galaxy that again, has a, a light travel distance of 13.4 billion light years, which is close to the 14 billion light years. But its present day distance because of the expansion of the universe is at 32 billion light years. Hmm. So, and the, the, the limit there is actually 47. That's in principle billion light years. That's in principle of we can look. So in my scenario of traveling from earth to the edge of the observable universe, you will never get there because light travels faster than you could travel by 0.0001%, right? Have you taken a look at any of the recent Star Wars that came out? Yeah, what do you have in mind? Which particular movie? The one in particular that I've watched recently was the Mandalorian series. Yeah, I watched that too. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. I, I like it. To me, Star Wars is always good. Are you a fan of the series? I like the Mandalorian, the series. It's a lot of fun. What do you think about the um, Star Wars as a film? Well, I watched them not when they came out. I watched them much later because I grew up in Germany and I remember when they came out in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a very small place. There were rarely any movie theaters there. So I watched the first three Star Wars movies much later when I was already in college. But Star Wars has been enormously influential mm. culturally. 
And again, what's fascinating to me is this whole concept is very creative and visionary. Apart from the little details, if they're possible, is this possible, is that possible? But visionary and creative, and this is not just what's important for science fiction. This is also very important when you do actual science, when you do research. Mm -hmm. That you are creative, you mean? And, and you do something visionary, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So what do you think is kind of the, the job of science fiction in terms of portraying the sciences? Well, the job is to entertain and also to, to just amaze the readership or the viewership it's just to broaden their horizons to confront them with ideas they have never thought about that's the main job and if all these things that are shown are realistic or not well for good science fiction that's the fiction part now the best science fiction writers i would argue their the science they have portrayed is probably more realistic than for other science fiction writers. Mm -hmm. The very famous examples of science fiction writers who were scientists, Arthur Clarke, for example, who first published this idea of communication satellite networks. So one of the most famous science fiction writers of all time, Isaac Asimov is another yeah. example. I mean, these people were legends. And if you read their books, then the science portrayed is, is very realistic. Mm -hmm. Um, an incredible, of, yeah. but if you watch a movie like 2001 by Kubrick, and I think almost all of the science shown in that movie is realistic. It's what, incredible. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the books that actually stand out to me is uh, War of the Worlds. It, it was released like I think in the, in the 1800s or something like that. And it, it portrayed the, you know, the invasion of an alien species where these huge tripods came out of the earth and like they were shooting uh, heat rays out of their mm -hmm. eyes. To me, like this guy must have been, <laughs> what was he? I don't know what was he doing at the time, but <laughs> to imagine a world like this and to like think about in the 1800s where, where like you were carrying things with horses and things like that, an alien species with huge machines. It's amazing, right? It's amazing how like, that can inspire an idea. And then somebody, some actual scientist can go and, and, and study that. I mean, really good science fiction, the ideas are sensational and they're very influential. If you think back about this movie Metropolis by Fritz Lang, which was made in 1927, I don't know if you have seen it. Mm -hmm. It was I one don't. of the most influential science fiction movies of all time. This is for the first time where robots were shown. And this again, people, this is incredible. Most people had not thought about this before. They see it now on screen and it makes them think. And this for me is the most important purpose of science fiction. Do you think and there are many other examples. If you go to, I mentioned the movie 2001. This I think was among the first times when something like Skype, FaceTime, Zoom was shown. Mm. And this was in the 1960s. And you would have thought at the time, what was he thinking? You know, <laughs> how did he come up with this? But here we are a few decades later, mobile phones, Star Trek in 1966. They take this little thing out of their pocket and then they talk. And at the time you thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a nice <laughs> little touch. But look at where we are. We cannot do without smartphones anymore. Self-driving cars in total recall in 1990. And look at what people are now thinking about. They're saying self-driving cars are not that far away. It's the future. Mm. I actually have a friends from uh, high school that are working on self-driving vehicles <laughs> not right now. But do you think in some way it can kind of misinform the public? Like, of course. Yeah. Yes, there are dangers there, of course. And that's why it's science fiction. And that's why our job of the scientist is to educate the public so that they we need to educate them so that they understand what is fact and what is fiction. This is, of course, is important, not just in the sciences nowadays. It's important everywhere where we have trouble distinguishing between the two. And we started out by talking about this, this course I'm teaching about 
physics and film. And this is exactly what that's supposed to do, that when the students are done with that course, that they have a really good feeling of what is possible and what is not possible. So entertain me a little bit. Let's talk about some of the science behind Star Wars lore, let's say. We spoke a little bit about speed traveling, but I want to know a little bit more about the weaponry used in, in Star Wars because a lot of the Space Wars themed movies show what you would call like, I don't know, laser weaponry. It's like this red flashing beam of light that's coming out of the gun or the ship. If we try to look at it from a scientific point of view, what do you think we're looking at? So these weapons, the blasters, for example, they cannot be lasers. Lasers, this is just coherent light that's very energetic. If you turn on a flashlight and you're outside, you cannot even see how these things move. It's, it's on these distances. The speed of light is instantaneous in everyday life. But what we see in the movies, we see these blasters moving at a finite speed. Mm. So they cannot be lasers. Also, if you have a laser beam moving in vacuum, nothing will scatter it so that you can see it. You would never be able to see it. You only see the impact. So in other words, again, what you're seeing in the movies cannot be lasers. Yeah. So the most likely thing, what they can be is they can, these can be plasma blobs. A plasma is sometimes called a fourth state of matter. So the other states of matter are solids, liquids, and gases. And picture a plasma like a gas, but a special type of gas. It behaves very differently from a normal gas. And if you pump enough energy into a gas, atoms consist of atomic nuclei. We talked about those. They fuse in stars and generate energy, but also there are the electrons. And a neutral atom will have as many electrons as there are protons in the nuclei. If you pump energy into this gas and you ionize the atoms, meaning the electrons have so much energy, they're not bound anymore to the atomic nuclei. Mm -hmm. That's a plasma. So essentially it's a gas where you have free electrons and ions left behind instead of neutral atoms. And this is, it's very, it has a lot of energy in it. You need to pump energy into it to ionize the matter. Now, the temperature, how hot it is, that depends on the density. A neon light, for example, is a plasma, but it's not very hot. You can touch the bulb because the density of the gas inside is very, very low. Mm -hmm. But these blasters that you see in the movies, those are most likely plasma blobs. Now, a plasma has so much energy, if you want to make it into a weapon, it got to be really hot, that it will dissipate. It will not just stay there as a blob, it will mm. dissipate. So somehow you need to confine it. This again now becomes a technological issue, not a fundamental physics issue. Mm -hmm. You need to generate an electrical current in the plasma. This current will produce a magnetic field and this magnetic field confines the plasma. This is how people try to confine the million degree temperature plasma by these, by magnetic fields. So if you now think much more smaller, you create a plasma blob, a current, it generates a magnetic field and that confines the plasma, then you could shoot that thing. And apparently the US Air Force is working along those lines since the 1970s. This is the Shiva star program which is classified, but apparently they have produced plasma-based weapons. Mm. So this is not entirely science fiction. So what would happen if, let's say, a plasma ray that we're talking about hits a wall in the real world? Like, would it go through it? Would it melt it? Would it ignite it? <laughs> so it is so hot, this plasma, if you want to build it as a weapon, that it will just burn through it. It will melt it. And what's the physics on that, on that rail? Is it, is it traveling super fast because of the charge? What's making it travel? No, this is an, an independent issue. You also need to give it some propulsion, some speed. Mm, okay. And there are different ways of doing this, but that has nothing to do with the concept of a plasma. Right. So right. you need some technology, maybe a rail gun to make it really travel very fast, as fast as you can. And there may be technologies that they could make this plasma move with a fraction of the speed of light, which mm. would be incredibly fast. 
but such plasma blobs would be able to destroy spaceships. I'm assuming that the same technology that we're talking about for a blaster is what we could potentially use for creating a real life lightsaber. Correct. Yes, because they cannot be light. They're not lasers because lasers work completely differently. You turn them on and then the light ray goes very far. So they must be based on plasma technology. And you can again think of a long tube of a plasma blob that again, you would need to produce an electrical current that generates a magnetic field to confine this so that you produce this lightsaber. But there are major issues. If you are in a lightsaber fight, if you That's could great. manage to produce these plasma tubes, they would just move through each other. Mm. So somehow that's not what we see in the movies. So somehow you need to maybe have a solid core inside that tube. But of course, if the plasma is very hot, it will melt every solid. So you need to find some material that doesn't melt easily. That doesn't exist right now. And of course, if the plasma is so hot, I mean, you want to wield a sword. You got to make sure that the heat does not melt the arm of the person who's wielding the lightsaber. But you see, again, these are technological problems, mm. not problems based on our fundamental understanding of, of physics. If, okay, so question. Is there some way that like there could be some sort of magnetic field that when when these two plasma rays collapse like they're actually bouncing on each other instead of going through <laughs> that's the only thing that i can think of well there could be maybe a very smart arrangement of electric and magnetic fields that perhaps could do that but then if you look at a lightsaber, it's a small thing when mm -hmm. you see it in the movies. You mean like yeah. the actual the actual technology, the handle? Yeah, all the technology that produces any of these things we're talking about, the, the current the in the plasma. And the, so that needs to be put all into a very small space. And right now, these things will take a vast amount of, of room to ensure this technology. What about if you implement some sort of theory of quantum mechanics? Wouldn't quantum mechanics say that there's a small percentage that the actual plasma rays would actually bounce each other? So in terms of quantum mechanics, yeah, it's a probability argument, which if you're in a fight with lightsabers, maybe you don't want to throw dice and take your chances. So if the probability that what of what you just mentioned, even if it's possible, if it's very small, it's like 1%, you don't want to go into a, a fight like that and right, right. place your odds <laughs> on that. No. So, so one of the, the other thing that you're mentioning is the shape of it, right? The uniformity of the shape is something that is technologically an obstacle. This will depend on the magnetic field that is confining the plasma. So that's shaping then this weapon. And like, how much energy do you think we need to actually create plasma, a plasma lightsaber, would you say? Like, oh, that I don't know. That I do not know. But again, this is a question of technology. If you mm -hmm. think about people who, welders, for example, they're very familiar with plasma cutters. And this is a device you can buy for 400 bucks. It's a box this big, and you just put it into a normal outlet, and then you can cut through steel. That's a few millimeters thick by mm -hmm. using this plasma cutter. And what's it? It's burning. It's burning gas though, right? No, no. It creates a plasma. That's why it's called plasma cutter. Mm -hmm. And then the temperatures are so high that it burns through steel. So my wife, for example, is an, is an artist. She uses a plasma cutter all the time to cut metal for her artwork. But what, what source of energy is it using? What is it? Oh, she just plugs it into an outlet, a normal 110-volt outlet. What? And you just press the button and it goes like... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. I see. So we just need to keep working on that. <laughs> yeah. So all I'm saying is, I know that many people think lightsabers, oh yeah, this is not possible. Or maybe that technology is, you know, a hundred years away. 
I think we're much, much closer to that when, mm. than what many people think. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I want to start kind of wrapping it up and I want to talk a little bit about some more philosophical questions about astrophysics when it comes to the cosmos. I, I don't know why people have a hard time thinking that there could be like other life forms out there, right? What do you what do you think? Because you you're you're invested in this world of of the cosmos. Do you think that there's a potential for other life forms out there? Absolutely, yes. And I think the field as a whole has gone through ups and downs. I think maybe in the '60s, if you would have asked most astrophysicists, they would have said, "Nah, we have no." indication that other planets even exist so yeah maybe we're alone in the universe but we know now that planets exist around other stars we have discovered thousands of these exoplanets mm -hmm. and there's no question in my mind that life forms are out there and this is very fascinating because now you can think about how did life on earth start does it start spontaneously on all planets where the conditions are right and those the numbers are incredible i mean there are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy alone and each of these stars may have 10 planets and you run the numbers and there's no question in my mind that that other life forms are out there or if life doesn't start spontaneously on its own on each planet then is it moving from one planet to another one somehow on asteroids and meteorites and comets all sorts of interesting questions i think one of the faults that we have is we think of life very related to us very related to how we live right it's hard to kind of picture an amoeba being a life form in another planet but i think what the, the the public is fascinated with or at least interested in the idea that there is more intelligent life form than us in the cosmos what do you think and then again right the idea of intelligence is so human that yeah but you can define it as apart from the definition of intelligence if there is a civilization out there with an advanced technology mm. that's how you can define yes. it and what will it be based on these other aliens you know, well, lots of theories first people said it got to be based on carbon carbon can produce these complex molecules dna and so on and other people have said well it could be silicon too under some circumstances but if you think about carbon is the fourth most abundant element in the universe it's everywhere so it's very likely that there are many, many life forms out there based on carbon, and a lot of them will have advanced technology. Now, as we said earlier, the distances in the universe are so huge among the stars. The closest star to us is four light years away. And if you go out to a hundred light years, there's probably a good chance that there are life forms that are that have advanced technology, it just, they're so far away and it becomes a problem of communication. How do you communicate with, with these life forms? To me, it's a question of why also, like why would you communicate, right? Because if there is like a sm more advanced species than us out there, I feel like they could be so advanced that we could technically be like ants to them. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, a lot of people have said, why are you guys looking, are you crazy? <laughs> because history told us every time an advanced civilization has encountered a less advanced one, we know how that ended every time. <laughs> right. But it's just this human curiosity. If we have the means to communicate and to observe, we will do so. So we cannot just come up with a law that says, do not look for alien life forms. It just will not happen. Now, what will happen if we make contact? That's very interesting. Are we the best life form out there that's possible? Certainly not. Because if you think about evolution, we are probably the best life form out there for the conditions on Earth. Mm -hmm. But conditions on other planets will be completely different. So evolution will adapt and produce not the best or the strongest life form, but it will produce the life form that best 
adapts to its environment. That's what evolution does. Mm -hmm. And we can assume that it works like this on every other planet. This means because conditions will likely be different on other planets, that life forms will be very different. They will have different advantages and other disadvantages compared to us. It just seems that from an outsider point of view, that if a, a theoretical physicist writes a book about how this space rock could technically be an alien trash that he's opened himself up to a kind of ridicule as if he's not necessarily thinking straight and and in some way i think it's because yes there's there's this critical reception of ideas when it comes to the scientific world but i also think that there's some sort of kind of shut down at these ideas because they're so challenging, right? They change the way that we would see reality. So we almost don't want them to be true because they would change things so much. Yeah, this is correct. And another good example, recently, there is the scientist, I forgot the name, who's pushing this idea of aliens. And people have said, he's a scientist. How can he be wrong? He's not just some crazy person who doesn't know anything about science. In recent times more in the news there are more documentaries on tv and and the internet they say yeah there are aliens we have proof they visited earth we have this and that we have these little images from the military and so on and again i would be highly highly critical and these people would say to me how do you know that there are no aliens that aliens have never visited earth well i don't know <laughs> how can you prove a negative you cannot prove a negative. So again, the way science works, we are very critical and we would say, give us more proof mm. so that you can convince us. And we're not convinced at all at this point. I mean, it's, I was going to ask you, but I think you gave me the answer. I was going to ask you whether or not you think aliens have visited Earth. And I think the scientific answer that you would give me is that there's not enough evidence for me to tell you that there is, right? I would say there's no evidence, not enough evidence to say that aliens ever visited Earth. My feeling is that I would love for aliens to have visited Earth, you know, <laughs> like that would be amazing. I want there to be aliens, but like, I want to believe that there's aliens, but like you said, like the evidence is not there. So I know I can't believe it, even though like my whole heart desires that outcome. Like, do, do you have like some sort of curiosity when it comes to uh, your field and like the things that you want to discover so related to aliens you no, mean, no or... related to oh. your field related to just the cosmos in general yeah i mean well, that's what we do in in fundamental science i think any society should invest in fundamental science because we would like to understand our surroundings better and nature better and that's why we do research it's funded by really the public who takes payers money and it's our job to then not just do this fundamental science but also to produce practical applications and also it's our job to educate the public and my field this is what research is about. It's about discovery. We are trying to discover new things. That's what we do in research. And there are lots of open questions. And what is very interesting to me is the interconnections of these questions. How did the solar system form? What does that say about how life formed? What will become of the sun? Why do some stars explode and so on? Christian, I think I think I'd, I I I'm running out of juice, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean it's it's just fascinating to learn these things for me. I think you also do a very good job at explaining, and you have a very like calm and soothing way of you. communicating. So it's always a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a pleasure. Just a little shout out. If people are interested to finding you, how do you, how do people find you? So if people Google my name, they will get to my website and then contact information is given there. And I'm pretty good at answering emails. Usually exactly. this is Iliadis at unc.edu but if they if people google my name christian iliadis then websites will pop up and... you're you're all you're all over the first the, no uh, no <laughs> the, the first it will be easy page of find. google <laughs> <laughs> All right, Christian, it's been it's been really, really fun. And, you know, I hope that I hope that you enjoyed it as well, because I hope that 
there's something that you could take out of this but with me trying to become a little bit more familiar with how science fiction and the story world influences real life i think that you're bringing in a very fresh interesting and informative side to things and i really appreciate you for it yeah thank you gabo this was a pleasure and also learned something <laughs> so i always learn from questions thank you so much christian for your time for your preparation yeah sure my pleasure um, thank you gabo 